Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session on interplanetary compute. To introduce ourselves, I would like to start off with Luca. Hello, everybody. My name is Luca, uh, Luca Rossettini. I'm the CEO and founder of The Orbit. And then Frederick. And I'm Frederick Brun, co-founder of Unibap and the chief evangelist nowadays. And my name is Buffy Wavoda. I head up the solution architecture team at AWS for aerospace and satellite. In terms of an agenda, we're going to briefly talk about the space economy, serving as the backdrop for these two customers to talk about how they're progressing the entire space economy. And then quickly, we're going to look to the future and how we actually start to use the amazing progress that companies like this are making to allow data connections further and further into space. First of all, let's talk about where the universe is going. Space, the next frontier. For centuries, the human race has been fascinated by space. How did it start? Where is it going? Space has furthered fields such as energy research, quantum mechanics, general string theory, and much, much more. And some scientific research is only available in space. For example, the microgravity in space allows us to grow protein crystals in a way that is not possible on Earth, which is enabling new ways to do drug research. Another example is the Twins Astronaut Study. For those who are not, uh, uh, who don't know this study, we had a pair of twins, one went up, one stayed here, and then we were able to sh see how the gene expression changed based on being in space for a number of times. So why now? Why focus on the space economy now? So let's look a, li a little bit at the history of space. In the 1950s and 60s, the entire space economy was dominated by two governments, U.S. and Russia. Space looked big, even on Earth. The mission control centers took up buildings. Fast forward to 2003, so less than 20 years ago, and now the space economy looks like three players. We have China in the game, who's independently able to launch astronauts into space on their Shenzhou 5 launch. Again, less than 20 years ago, we're talking about three major players. And now, we have 10,000 companies supporting space, from satellite companies to rocket companies, from human spaceflight to autonomous vehicles. The space economy is booming. As we reach further into space, we're going to need to establish communication hubs. Here with me today, Luca Rosentini, founder and CEO of D-Orbit, is going to discuss some of that infrastructure. Thank you. So thank you, everybody. Um, yes, it's really amazing. I'm, I'm a space addicted, as probably many of the people here, right? So I want to become an astronaut, as probably some of you. I, I couldn't make it, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm building the spaceship to go <laughs> later on. So for me, space, um, it's really uh, infrastructure. Uh, without the infrastructure, there will be no businesses in the future in space. That's why at the orbit, we are creating the first space logistics infrastructure to enable the existing space economy, uh, the new one, the commercial one, but also uh, the human expansion in sustainable space. Why, why logistics? We tend to take logistics for granted here on Earth, but if you think about it, there will be no businesses here on Earth uh, without logistic services. Even if you produce pens, you need someone to pick up the pens of the factory, deliver to the distributor, and so on to the local shop, in which you can buy a pen for one dollar. In space, at the beginning, we didn't need logistics, because we have these huge satellites, very performing, very expensive, and, and, and uh, you could place them exactly where they, they need to operate, and uh, the only logistic you needed was a rocket uh, capable of bringing the satellite there. Uh, but now, as uh, Buffy was explaining, the market changed. Now we have companies that are launching dozens, hundreds, even thousands of satellites. These satellites are way smaller, way cheaper, 400 times cheaper, and also they are not long-lasting as in the traditional space. They last only a few years, two, three, maybe five years in space. So time is of essence for those satellites. There's another element, those satellites are not deploying in one single position, but they need to be dispersed along the orbit in order to deliver their service properly on Earth. And they are using multiple orbits as well. 
So now you understand that we have a bottleneck. How can we make sure that satellite operators are capable of making a good use in no time of their asset in orbit in order to deliver service to us here on Earth? And, and that's why we invented the concept of space logistics. So we manufacture these cargo satellites. Uh, it's like, uh, you know, like trucks that you can fill with satellites of other customers. You pick the first available rocket. Once the rocket delivers the cargo in space, you move around and then deploy the satellites exactly where they need to operate. And we, we can accomplish this phase in uh, two to four weeks. So basically, we can reduce the time uh, from launch to revenues for our customers by 85% and the overall cost of deployment by 40%. That's the power of infrastructure. You can reach orbits that were not reachable before because rockets are not going there. You can optimize in a different way uh, your constellation and so on. And, and since satellites are becoming more and more software, right, so the, you, can, you can understand how this optimization can actually be extremely interesting if you have a constellation of satellites. So this is our cargo. Uh, you fill with satellites, you reach space, then you start deploying the first one, then you move into another part of space in another orbit, you deploy other satellites. We can reach pretty much every orbit around the Earth Theoretically, we can even deploy satellites around the moon. Uh, to be fairly transparent, no one is paying me to deliver satellites around the moon today. Uh, but you know, this is coming. So this is coming and the, the capabilities are there. Um, that's uh, also changed the way you produce satellites. Satellite, producing satellites was an artisan work. And now you need to go into serial production of satellites. So we are not looking at what other space companies are doing. We look at what automotive is doing, or what oil and gas energy are doing. So different sectors that are actually are entering into the space domain. This is our cargo on a rocket. And from this moment, we start our mission. We move into the right position in space. And then we start deploying the satellites. So here you see a couple of CubeSats. And in, uh, in this video that we took from the, uh, from the cargo, you see way a bigger satellite that we deployed. And the interesting aspect that this video, so this deployment lasts only two to four weeks. And then what? I still have an asset in orbit that I can use to deliver additional service to my customers. So every time we fly one of our cargo, it's, it's named Ion, we are adding another element to a new type of constellation. I like to call it dynamic constellation because I can place these satellites in different orbits, different position to deliver different service to satellite operators. And just to, to name a few, um, imagine young startups that have a very good technology that they want to deploy either to build their own satellites or they want to, to sell it on the market. Today it takes years and millions of dollars to test the technology in orbit. So what we do, we put those technologies into our cargo and then we can test them, we can test them in orbit. Of course, uh, I'll come later to tell you what you need on top of just the infrastructure or transportation to test technology in orbit. But that's, that's a very important element. Or if you are a well-established satellite operator company, you already have 20 satellites, let's say for Internet of Things services or even Earth observation, and you know that you need an additional 20, 60 satellites in the future to improve your service. Why? Why not giving me your payload? I put it on my cargo. By the end of next year, I will have additional 20 cargo in orbit that you can rent instead of spending money in CapEx and, uh, and uh, focus on operations, focus on extracting data and services, and deliver to your customers. Um, and then, of course, uh, the next step is going to be in orbit servicing. So you transport satellites, you serve the satellites that are there, and then you go and grab them, extend the life of the satellites in order to for satellite operators to produce more revenues and uh, 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 move them in other places in space to serve different markets, or even remove the satellites at the end of life. Very important aspect. So you don't want that those dead satellites create issues to the existing one, to the functioning one. And uh, as you can imagine, all these, ad ad I, I like to call them advanced services that are on top of the transportation, are quite complex. Just to give an example, if you have to get close to another satellite, 
And, you, and, and uh, the reason why I show you the video before is because you understand that the capabilities are there. But then you need to understand, you need to understand how the satellite is behaving. Is it tumbling? Is it broken or not? Uh, you know, all this information need to be processed. And you don't really want to do it manually. I mean, if you have hundreds of spacecraft that are going to perform this service, you want, you want a full automation. Full automation comes with a lot of computational capabilities that you want to have on board of your satellite. But then if you increase the, the, the computational power, then you need more energy. Then if you need more energy, you need bigger solar panels. And that's create complexity and cost. If you have bigger solar panel, then you need to have a bigger structure because you need to hold the solar panels. And, that's, and you understand that it's a negative uh, spiral of cost that keep increasing. That's really not smart. That's not a good direction in which we are building the logistics infrastructure. So, and this also reminds me, you know, at the beginning, when, when we created the orbit, my mechanical engineers were coming to me every year and a half at the beginning, say, oh, my computer is too slow. Can we change it? And then they start coming every six months. And then every single month they were complaining that the computer was not fast enough. So what, what did we do? We switched to the cloud, right? As 90% of the companies, right? So we switched to the cloud. So why not doing the same in space? What if my cargo comes with a server on board and my dynamic constellations is actually becoming a, a space cloud infrastructure? At that point, you have a cloud infrastructure in orbit that can provide this type of support to all the future spacecraft or the existing satellite operators. Just to complete the example of the in-orbit servicing, my spacecrafts are going to be a sort of terminals. They will have a, a minimum computational capabilities, and they will rely on cloud in order to perform all the operations. So, um, but what can we do today with the cloud? Because yes, it's very nice imagining in orbit servicing in the future and, and maybe using this infrastructure uh, for moon missions and Mars missions. But you know, at the end of every month, they explain me that they have to pay salaries to my employees, right? Every single month, right? So <laughs> if I have to do that, I need to make sure that whatever we do, I can use it today and it has to be built for the future. Um, okay. I think something happened. Anyway, so, um, so the, the, um, the, the overall value that we can provide today to satellite operators, it's related to the, uh, the same power of cloud that we use today on ground. So imagine a satellite. A satellite can collect an enormous amount of data, but only a fraction of this data is going to be downloaded to Earth. Right? So only a fraction. There's a, a bandwidth issue. There is a power issue on board of the satellite. There is an issue of availabilities of ground stations, antennas that, can, that are able to grab the, the data. Um, and then whatever you download, so imagine you take a lot of pictures with your satellites, you download, then some of them are not good. So it's pretty much when you take pictures with your phone, you take 20 pictures and then you save only three and you discard all the others. Um, so. Uh, the remaining pictures, you put them into a cloud. You have your own amazing AI machine learning application. You run it, you extract the information, and then you sell the information to the agriculture, oil and gas, and whatever sector, right? So um, this is really, again, not efficient, but it is what it is. Today, it's, it's uh, how the, the satellite uh, business works. What if you can move whatever you are doing on ground into space? First of all, you have access to, theoretically, to the 100% of the amount of data that the satellite can, uh, can generate. You can like, discard immediately what is not good and keep what is good, process directly in cloud, extract the information. You don't even need to download the images anymore. They are quite heavy. You can download the information that is immediately ready to be sold on the market. That's, that's not just improving the potential revenues of satellite operators, but also reducing the time uh, from the information that you generate in orbit to the final user. 
And, that's, and, and, and this is uh, going to be uh, changing the way we are going to operate in space. I just want to give you a uh, few examples of potential applications of this type of uh, utilization of the cloud. So, um, and I use three main areas that I think are the most, uh, the most important for, for us as a society. So today, when you have um, uh, like a climate issue, an hurricane, uh, or even an earthquake, uh, satellites are used quite often. But the, the delay, um, it's, it's something that it's, uh, you know, deciding uh, life or death of many, many, many people. What if we can shorten that? If we can elaborate everything in orbit, then you have, and then you use the cloud, and the cloud is distributed. So there's, there's not going to be only the deorbit cloud. There's going to be many other companies with their satellites acting as a cloud, and all these satellites will communicate to each other. So at this point, you can download the information like almost in, uh, in real time. Um, almost in real time, and you have immediately available the information, and you can use it to save people, save life. Um, uh, civil security and public protection. That's a very important topic uh, in these days, unfortunately, I have to say. Uh, you, can, you can operate the cloud for object detection, like illegal shipping, piracy, smuggling, and, 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 and so on, uh, but also uh, crowd location and detection. And, and definitely you can monitor how the pollution evolves and provide immediate information. So for example, you may decide to shut down entire industrial areas if you see that the pollution is, going, is increasing too fast, right? And you can do that if you have these capabilities in orbit. And then of course, disaster monitoring and, and response. Uh, uh, one of the missions that we made, uh, as I said, we, we test technologies also for other companies. We had this infrared camera that was designed to detect wildfire. If you put together the sensors with the computational capabilities, the edge computing you can do in orbit, and then you have the infrastructure, that's, you understand how this is going to impact positively uh, all of those that are working on this, uh, on, 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 this, uh, on, on this action plan that they need to deploy as soon as possible. So the cloud computing in orbit, it's definitely going to improve the way we are using satellites today. Uh, but it's not just for today. As we said, uh, we are really imagining uh, an infrastructure that, go, that uh, goes beyond uh, what is around the Earth. And if we have to do that, there's another element that we need to take into consideration. That is creating a future capable of future. So we want to make sure that whatever we deploy in space, it's not a dead end. It's not killing us. So we need to make sure that whatever we design, we already have in mind the next step. So when we say that we are going to remove satellites that are not working anymore, uh, our objective is not just to destroy the satellites uh, driving them into the atmosphere. That's, of course, today it's a necessity, but tomorrow we are going to drive them into a recycling station in orbit. You recycle satellites, you produce raw material that is going to be used to produce new spacecraft in orbit. And that actually makes a lot of sense. We are not building boats on the desert and move them into the sea. Why should we build satellites on Earth if we are going to use them in orbit? And then with orbital manufacturing, you can build spacecraft that are, that are superior, that are way more effective, and then you can really go for uh, interplanetary settlement. So you understand now that this picture that at the beginning, if I put it at the beginning of my presentation, could look like just science fiction. Now it's actually something that makes sense. So connecting Mars, the asteroid belt, Moon, and Earth through a network of routes in which you can transport goods, people, and information thanks to the, the cloud infrastructure that is enabling all of this. So concluding, the air to space, it's the market in which we are living now, right? So satellites that produce data for us here, our society on the Earth. This market needs an innovative ecosystem to enable the expansion towards uh, what I define as space to space market. And the space to space market, uh, it's, uh, as you can imagine, it's infinite by definition, so can only grow. And that's, that's the beauty of, of what we are doing today. Um, and the a distributed uh, space cloud infrastructure can provide on-demand high power, low latency, distributed computational resource uh, to a constellation of smaller 
low power satellites and in the future to any spacecraft that is going to fly in space. Thank you. Thanks, Luca. In order to build this infrastructure into space, special attention needs to be paid to the hardware of space. Space is not a kind environment. To walk us through how we're tackling this today, I'd like to introduce Frederick Brune to the stage to talk about some of the stuff he's doing at his company, Unibap, to enable radiant tolerant hardware. Thank you very much, Buffy, and thank you, Luca, for setting the stage, and thank you also, AWS, to inviting us here. Unibap was founded in 2013 with the goal of democratizing space. We wanted to make sure that you can reuse the same cloud infrastructure in space that you have on ground. So the same set of tools like TensorFlow and PyTorch and Kubernetes and Docker and all those things that you are used to work with. And this is very important because, as many of you know, we've been using very old processors in space with all sorts of weird architectures. So for a long time, we had to redevelop all of the software for space. And that's really stupid because we have a lot of software on ground that we would like to use in space. However, it's a fundamental problem to build an x86 server that operates in space. So we set out in 2013 to work together with AMD here from the US to find a way to safely execute an x86 heterogeneous architecture in space. And we have now been able to demonstrate that in space together with the orbit and the European Space Agency. So I will take you down that path and show you how we do that and give you some examples on how it's possible. What's interesting is that we began launching heterogeneous x86 computers to space in 2016, and we are on a commercial Earth observation constellation since quite a while, running CPUs, GPUs, storage, and FPGAs in space successfully. So let's dig into this a little bit more, what we have done and how we ended up here. One of the important notions also is that in 2020, in December, we had a press release together with AWS that was signed by Shane Hawthorne. And it says that we are integrating AWS storage, edge, and cloud capabilities into something that is called Space Cloud. And what does that mean? Well, Space Cloud is a combination of hardware that we build together with AMD and an orchestration layer that is aware of radiation effects. So whenever we have radiation effects that uh, changes the execution of the x86, we can recover from that and we can inform running uh, containers about those issues and we can restart containers in space. And this is currently based on Docker's. But if we go back to the reason why we do this, so Luca already mentioned detection and prediction and analyzing data in space. So this is all about taking decisions in space to reason within data and reason within constellations so that you can reap all the benefits of a constellation. So you're moving along this arrow you can see here that you need, for instance, to do classification and you need to have prediction by the time you have prediction, you have intelligence, and then you can connect the dots just the same way we do on ground. And in order to illustrate this, I took an example of a US satellite that is being assembled right now. It's leveraging space cloud. It's called the HITI mission. It's a technology demonstrator funded by NASA, by the Earth uh, Science Technology Office. The purpose of this small satellite is to demonstrate uh, capabilities in the order of the Landsat program. You know those very big, very costly NASA satellites. So a subset of that will be demonstrated on this mission using cooled thermal sensing. And this sensor produces 100 gigabytes per day, but we can only download about 4 gigabytes per day. So obviously there is a problem. The scientists would like to have every bit of data untouched, 
but the link doesn't support that, so you need to do something with the data. And it, I know it's quite small, but you can see in the chart here, on top of that you have some white lines, and these white lines symbolizes different satellites and where in the spectra they are located. And this mission is rather unique because it has 25 bands that overlaps with the Landsat mission. And this is not bigger than a shoebox. It's 10 by 30 by 10 centimeters. So it fits on Luca's platform and can deploy it in different orbits. In space, in, in geospatial uh, operations in particular, you talk about L0 to L4 data, where L0 data is raw data. L1 is a little bit processed data, and L2 is the level where you can start to generate data products. The unique thing with this satellite is that the L0 to L2 processing is done on board. So we generate the data products on board and can send them down to Earth very quickly. And then the scientists can also ask for additional high resolution data. So we are actually processing on the satellite from 100 gigabytes per day down to 4 gigabytes per day of L1 data. That's corrected data. So it's not just scientific. This is being built in the US. We are even more advanced in, in Europe because we are already flying this. But to give you an example of how it works, so this is the shoebox. It's being assembled by University of Hawaii, the Hawaii Space Flight Lab. The computer in the middle, that's our uh, space computer developed with Intel and AMD, both together. So it has an AMD processor inside, an AMD GPU. It has a neural network accelerator from Intel, and it has an FPGA from Microsemi as well as storage as well. So we collect the IR data, we process it, and this is an example of a data product. You can actually see different minerals uh, on Earth, for instance. This happens to be clay, but it could really be anything. So you can see the size of this thing. It's 10 by 10 by 5 centimeters. It about 20 watts of power, and it gives you the same cloud experience in orbit as you have on ground. Obviously, a cloud on ground will have more performance, uh, but it has all the same aspects uh, that you have on ground. In order to scale this out, you need to have a roadmap, and we also obviously have a roadmap as well. And we're looking at a next generation processor, it's called the iX20 platform, where we have a computational performance in the order of 30 to 50 tera operations per second. And why is that important? Well, if you have a neural network background, you would realize that these numbers is the point where you can start to do retraining in orbit. This is the point where you can now start to have learning in orbit. You can do transfer learning between different satellites. You can uh, train for new things, for instance, that gets detected, that one algorithm is saying that, hmm, this is interesting, I would like to go deeper in this. You can also do things like reinforcement learning and things like that. So we are on a fast track to build uh, out this roadmap together with the European and the Swedish Space Agency. We are working very closely with the orbit to prove out all of these technologies in space. And to give you one example, on the SCV-4 mission that uh, Luca's team launched in January this year, we are running uh, quite many different applications nowadays. You can see an example here that we have executed 80 applications. You can see that we have used about 43 minute execution time, of which we have 54 uh, minutes CPU time. You have 14 minutes GPU time and six minutes of VPU time. The VPU in this case is the Intel Movidius Myriad X, if you're familiar with that device. But we mentioned that space is a hostile environment, and if you look at this picture to the left, you see dips in the data. So this is from February 8th, when we passed over the pole, we came over uh, Sweden, and this was the same time when uh, SpaceX lost 40 satellites because of a geomagnetic storm. 
And sure enough, we saw a lot of interesting effects on our fault detection, isolation, recovery data, the FDRR health data. So these events you see here are actually high energetic protons going straight through that computer, changing the health data in real time. And as you can see, we are able to monitor that and we can also operate through as well. What's interesting is that the space cloud infrastructure in space with the orbit is running applications as containers, just the same way you do on ground. And we are using TensorFlow, for instance, and other tools. I wanted to give you one example that uh, Luca also referred to. Together with the European Space Agency, uh, the Orbit and Trillium, a global consultancy company, we have been able to demonstrate that we can process Sentinel-2 chips in orbit. Sentinel-2 is the European Union Earth Observation Satellite Constellation. One of these chips with eight different bands comes in about 2.5 gigabytes of data. And we have been able to process this in orbit down to 267 kilobytes. And the pink areas that you see is vectorized flooding areas. So autonomous flooding detection in orbit, and we reduce the data by 99.9%. .9%. And as Luca said, communication is almost one-to-one -one in cost with the amount of data you have. So it's also a cost reduction of 99% as well. But the real benefit is that you are freeing up 99% of the bandwidth for other data. Because we already know what Earth looked like since before. We don't need to have the raw data once more. So we are very happy to be able to announce this. And we presented this together with the Orbit at a European Space Conference a few weeks ago as well. So it is really in orbit. It is working. All the tools that you have on ground can be reused. Let's have a, a little look down into the, the hardware. This is an example. It's of a family called iX10, which is uh, driven by the AMD Ryzen family. So you can see that it's uh, eight CPU threads, about two uh, teraflop of GPU power, and you have uh, about 1,000 DSP cores in the FPGA, and you can have multiple uh, Intel Movidius accelerators on this as well. This particular unit can have up to about eight terabytes of local storage. And it's the same 10 by 10 by five centimeter in size. In order to know that this is working in space, we have worked very closely with NASA to do radiation testing at the Brookhaven National Lab here in the US, as well as Texas A&M. So let's dig into that a little bit more. One of the things is that you saw from a previous slide that we have radiation effects. So we need to mitigate that somehow. We need to know when the GPUs are uh, executing uh, erroneous code or the CPU. One way of doing that is to use a software middleware that does software voting either on one machine or on several machines at the same time running in parallel. And in radiation testing, we have been able to show that with a clever middleware, we can improve the single event upset ratios uh, by two to three times. But what's really interesting is when you connect two or more of these boards together and you do voting between them, then we have tested at TAMU that we can improve the radiation resilience by 720 times. So that means that you go from seeing an average event every third day in low Earth orbit to 5.9 years. So this is really key to go beyond LEO. If you go to the moon or if you go cislunar or if you go to Mars, you need to have this kind of single event mitigation middleware uh, with you. And this sits between the orchestration layer and the hardware. I, I added some references in here as well. If you want to read more, if you reach out over email, we can tell you more about it. But when you get to this point, you can wrap up basically by saying that, hey, OK, we have a working x86 infrastructure in space. Now we can begin to scale this. How do we scale it on ground? You buy more and more blades in a 19-inch rack system. You can do the same in space. You add in more and more of these, and you connect them together. You cluster them. 
and remember to keep that single event mitigation software. This is a technology conference, so we have to dig in a little bit into different values. So it, it's interesting when you start to look at various compute capabilities on the market. So back in 2019, we performed the first big radiation testing campaign. We started with the AMD Ryzen V1000 family, and we also looked at the NVIDIA Savior. And maybe you know that there are a lot of NVIDIA, embedded NVIDIAs flying in space, but if you look at the radiation data, that's not something you should continue to do because you can never build a commercial service out of that. And the reason is the numbers. So in 2019, we saw early indications that it's not promising to use NVIDIAs in space. And then in 2021, so last year, we did a more extensive analysis on this as well. And single event latch up, SEL that you see here, you really want that number to be higher than 37. And the reason you want it to be higher than 37 is that's the threshold for ferrum or ion ions that are coming in from um, the universe hitting your satellite. They come in at a threshold of 37. So if you're lower than 37, you have a problem. If you're higher than 60, it's very good because that means that you can go anywhere in the planetary system. And AMD happens to come in at 60 or higher MEVs, which is really good. And we are seeing failures with, the, in this case, the Savior AGX at single digit numbers, which is terrible. That's really, really low. So it, uh, again, you have the reference here. If you want to dig into the data, shoot me an email and we can make sure that you, you get that. But what's really critical is not the compute part, it's the support circuitry. So what tend to kill you in space are the power circuits. You have to be very careful when you do uh, power design. And most of you know that if you buy NVIDIA, you buy the SOM, the, the module, and there are components on that module that is not good for space at all. Yes, we got some numbers in here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Frederick. Onward to the future. So the stuff of science fiction is beginning to become reality. In fact, NASA plans to put a base on moon in 2024. That is only two years away. Scientists are beginning to coalesce around the number of 2050 for when we'll have colonies on Mars. The colonies that we put out in space from Moon, from Mars, they're going to need to be able to talk back to the Earth. But space is big. Depending on the relative orbits of Mars and Earth, a communication line between the two can take four minutes to 24 minutes. At that length of time, communication is no longer reliable. Even if we think about lasers and doing sort of light technology to get communications between the two planets, you have to worry about things like space dust, which is going to degrade the laser to the point where you can't actually prove that your data is going to get to one way or the other. So in order to enable communication for interplanetary compute, we're going to have to start building infrastructure in space. Luckily, we have companies like D-Orbit and Unibap who are working to make this possible. With their D-Cloud platform, as well as the Unibap radiant tolerant hardware, we can actually begin to think about how will astronauts stream Netflix on Mars? Thank you very much. We do have time for some questions. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you. 
So I'll repeat the question just so it goes on the video. So it's a question on data sovereignty, right? So on Earth, companies, governments are starting to talk about where data is located and where data is governed. How does that look like in space? So I, I start and I give you, I give you the floor. So um, let's, let's take a step back and look at what space is today in terms of regulations, right? So it, it looks a lot like the, the old Wild West, right? So in the old Wild West, you could not kill people. But if you kill someone, say, uh, okay, don't do it again, right? So that's space today. So there's still a lot to do. And there are many, many different round tables around this planet. They are all cooperating, talking to each other, and many companies are involved. So we are involved, for example, in many, um, uh, like in the many tables that are talking about how to regulate space debris, right? So what to do in that case, what potential uh, solutions there are for helping companies keep growing, but also at the same time avoid to create a bottleneck for the entire development of the ecosystem, right? So uh, this is happening right now. So uh, we are also cooperating with several companies that are working on, the, on, on, on data policies uh, on Earth, but also they are, as you said, let's, let's don't stop here because data, first of all, data is generated in space. And as, as we saw here, it's going to be processed and uh, used in space directly. So um, I don't think, I, I, I cannot tell you, in my opinion, what is going to be the best solution, but I tell you that many, many different organizations are working on that. The difficulty is that when you talk about space, you talk about a global uh, uh, landscape. So it's not a regional anymore. It's not the United States that, it's, that has to approve internal rules. It's the entire planet. So, and I think in order to get to a certain point, we will need to cooperate a little bit better at the international level. Because when you are in space, you don't see boundaries, right? And that's something that, uh, and we are not really going in the right direction as a, as a human society right now. So I think there are also some societal aspects that we need to work on if we really want to speed up the process. That's at least uh, my view. So to add to what Luca just said, do you think that the world in 2022 today looked like the world we had in 1967? It's slightly different. I think we all can agree on that. Why did we make that comparison? In 1967, the United Nations formulated five different laws. They commonly go under the name of the Outer Space Treaty from 1967. Those five laws are the only thing that regulates Space West, or whatever we want to call it. And th those five rules doesn't really say that much at all. So uh, going back to the Wild West or the Space West, that's really what it looks like. There isn't any real boundaries today. And it's, I'm not that hopeful either that we will see a United Nations coming up with some more stringent rules that everyone would follow in the next three to, to five years, maybe in 10 years. But I think we have to do a lot of self-regulation going forward while waiting for the formal uh, legal aspects to come in place. If, if I can add, so on, on the space debris, what we are doing as a companies, even if in the future we are going to become competitors, in the future, even the concept of competition is changing, right? So in a market that is growing so fast, now we are cooperating. We talk to each other and say, okay, which standard are you going to use to do this? And uh, which type of operations? How many years? Uh, what are, what are this, our suggestions to the governments, right? So, and that's, that's uh, companies that actually take action. And I think this is the, the best way, because uh, you do it in a, in a good way for the, like from a company perspective, but you are also preserving your own um, environment. So that's, I think, it's a potential solution to overcome the like the slow pace of putting together 160 nations and take one decision. Thank you for that. Any other questions? Gentleman back there went first. Repeating the question, how is quantum computing going to uh, basically impact space exploration? Uh, uh, to my knowledge, it will uh, basically do the same revolution it will do on ground, but it will take a lot longer time 
because quantum computing and radiation is not a good combination. It is extremely difficult to get a qubit that work in space. So I, I think that it will come, but it will probably take another 10 years. Now I will probably get beaten for saying <laughs> 10 years, but something like that, because we need to come up with a way of cooling a qubit that is not affected too much by radiation or you need to have some very elaborate uh, failure mechanisms that are not in place yet. Thank you. I believe you were next. Thank you. Uh, my presentation is absolutely fantastic. I have so many questions. <laughs> Absolutely. So to repeat the question, it's basically, why invest in space? Why not take all of those resources and just invest terrestrially? And if we're going to invest in space, how do we grow the talent to make that possible? So um, I'll start with the, the second part when you ask, what, what are we doing, right? So uh, very recently, we create uh, the Deorbit Academy. Uh, in that it's uh, especially used for high school students uh, and early university students that are not yet uh, looking for like an internship, right? So they are not yet ready to work, uh, but they are still at the beginning. That is a very difficult year in which you have to decide what to do. Maybe you were forced by your parents to, you know, to do something and maybe it's not yours and you need something to understand very quickly because you cannot waste years of your life. And the high school, especially, I think uh, high school students are extremely, extremely smart. And we are not really using this smartness uh, like in a good way because we think they are too young, but actually they are not. I was selling software when I was at the high school, right? So I was uh, like paying for, for my like Saturday nights uh, at that time. So uh, the The Orbit Academy works in this way. It's a sort of training on the job. So students come, uh, they spend uh, from two weeks to one month top in the company working on something that is going to fly. And the fact that it's going to fly, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's cool, right? So everybody wants to, to send something in space. Uh, but it's also put you in a situation in which you have really to face like, very difficult decisions. Because when you have to fly, I mean, you really have to fly. You cannot miss the deadline. Uh, and the, the system shall work on ground, because otherwise it's not going, you, you cannot go upstairs with a screwdriver and then fix it. So, and, and this is what we are offering at the moment uh, to students. Uh, we start interacting with uh, also other companies that have nothing to do with space, that they want to have this expertise to train their own managers. And, uh, and we bring students also in that, so to show that space is not anymore for space people. And in terms of description of talents, we, we, we take talents from every, every industry. There, there is no limitation. There are some role, especially like system engineers, that are you know, more specific for space, because you need to understand how it works. Uh, but generally speaking, I mean, it's a new market. As I said, uh, when we have to set up the line of production, I couldn't work what the other you know, traditional companies were doing. I didn't have any reference, so I went to the automotive. And I said, okay, how do you build cars? And let's try to replicate and, and adapt. And this is also going to be the same when we are going to export into orbital manufacturing. Let's look at what other sectors already did. Our business model are taken from software. So we are selling our services from uh, like copying and paste the software business models, right? So uh, if others already did it before and it worked, it's likely that it's going to work in space as well. 
Space is just younger than many other sectors. It's just a different stage of evolution, uh, you know, but it's, it's, uh, it's going to behave as uh, uh, like energy, electric cars, uh, oil and gas, uh, pharma, and, and, and so on. To add to that, I think that space have a very important role also for the life on Earth. As you've seen uh, with the terrible things going on in Ukraine, we wouldn't know that if we didn't have uh, global space assets that can look into Ukraine and give us a picture. And since we don't have a legal framework to work in within space, the, the only thing that we have is to shame people, shame countries. That works to a little bit. Some countries simply don't care. But if you have the ability to bring in a global perspective, and you can put shame on certain countries for war crimes and atrocities, for instance, in Ukraine, that will help us create a better world on, on Earth, because we will know when people misbehave. But that, that's one part of it. The other part of it is that we need, for instance, resources that are available on the moon for our future um, energy consumption. We need uh, other aspects of uh, space as well to survive as a species in the long time. But when it comes to talents, I think that what we have done to democratize space is really the key because now, you, as Luca said, you don't need to be a space engineer. You can be a software developer or you can work with the human mind. You can work on international collaboration. How are we going to have 100,000 people working on the moon or moving to Mars, and how do you work together? The psychology aspect, the, the uh, remote medicine, the uh, zero gravity impact on humans, all of the research that can be done in space that cannot be done on Earth because of gravity. So th th there are so many aspects of this to, to look at. But for me, one of the most important things to democratize space is to be able to shames certain countries for their behavior. So we probably have time for one more quick question. Yeah, space debris. It's, uh, you know, the funny story is that there was a scientist named Kessler, a uh, NASA scientist, and that's uh, like 50 years ago, about 50 years ago, he predicted what, 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 what is happening right now. So, yes, uh, space debris is going to be the biggest bottleneck and issue for the development of the space sector. Um, today we have a success rate, not, not the orbit, like everyone, success rate of 50%. That it's uh, way far from the 90% that was required. Okay, so we are still not at the point in which we can claim, oh yes, we are behaving in a good way. So there are several ways that you can do. First of all, you need to tackle the economic angle. Because uh, if we just keep saying, oh, we need to you know, uh, clean up space, then who's going who's gonna to pay for that? Right? So if you tackle the, and, and that's actually the beauty of the constellations. There are commercial constellations. So if you take a constellation uh, that there there have several satellites in different orbits, they cannot afford uh, more than two to eight defunct satellites per orbit before degrading the service that they are going to provide. That's, uh, I said two to eight because we analyzed some of them. There may be different numbers, but usually what we see is in the terms of units, not on you know, multiple, uh, multiple satellites. So that's actually very good because it means that they need to do something. Otherwise, the, their customers are going to complain. Imagine you are watching the, you know, a big match, and then at a certain point, the, like, the signal goes up, right? So you, you, you don't want to do it if it is the, 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 the Super Bowl, right? So uh, in order to do that, they, they are working on different strategies. So in orbit servicing is one that I showed you before. Uh, what we are proposing is a mixed strategy. So it's, uh, it's a mix of orbital clearance. So you have a device on every satellite that is autonomous, independent from the satellite. It is capable of removing the satellite for a few kilometers. So you are out of the danger area, uh, but you still have a debris. Plus the in-orbit servicing that at that point could be extremely low cost 
because you have all the time to go and grab the, the object and remove it properly. That's, uh, that's uh, at the moment it's still new. So that's, uh, there was a demonstration by Northrop Grumman and there are very, very few companies that are advanced in order to do that. Apart, I mean, apart from the orbit, you find Astroscale. There's a Swiss company, Clear Space, but they are still almost on paper. They are developing quite fast, but they are not there yet. So there are many, many startups that are helping. So seeing the number of companies that are willing to tackle the problem, I feel reassured because those companies need to move fast and speed is of essence in, uh, to solve the problem. And to add to that, uh, maybe you saw on Luca's slides also, it said that it leads to less satellites if you have more intelligence on every satellite. If you can use every satellite for more, you don't need to launch as many. So that's really where cloud computing comes into play as well because you can do a lot more with every satellite you launch. So in the end, you can keep the numbers as low as possible. Yep. All right, everyone. Thank you very much for attending the session today. Thank you. Please remember to take the survey and have a great Remars. Thank you. Thank you.